Around the world, there are different measurements for distance, weight, electricity. There's a bunch of ways to measure pressure. You've got bar, atmospheres, tor, PSI. There are lots of different currencies. Even television formats are different in Europe, Japan, and America. But it seems like everyone uses 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours to a day, and seven days a week. When did that happen? Who went on a crusade around the world to sink time? Is this a modern thing, or did this happen in like the 1600s? This video is about time, and it's about time I learned how this all went down. Way back sometime, around 3500 BC, over 5,000 years ago, the Babylonians came up with 60 minutes. They had a system of mathematics based on the number 60. That's going to come into play later on. Way more recently, but not recently at all, in ancient Egypt, around 1500 BC, it was common to use a sundial to tell the time of day. Sundials were segmented into 12 parts, and we think that was a result of the importance they saw in the 12 lunar cycles of the year. That's also why there are that many months. It was either that, or because when they would count, apparently they would use the segments on each finger on either hand, but they would use their thumb as a pointer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. How we know something like that is beyond me and maybe some historian just made it up. A sundial would tell time a bit differently depending on what time of the year it was. So we humans didn't use actual hours that are a standardized length until way, way, way later with the advent of mechanical clocks sometime in the 1300s. Some 1500 years before clocks, it had been proposed by a Greek guy named Hipparchus Hello. using the 12 equal hours of day and night on the equinox days in order to do calculations relations about celestial bodies. But other than two days out of the year, equal hours were not common until 14th century Europe. So that covered the 12 hours of the day, but for night, you can't use a sundial. Ancient Egyptians just loved using the stars at night for stuff, and this was no exception. They used this tool called a merket, which required a team of two, a slit cut into a bay leaf, and two sticks that had weighted lines, which when all used together correctly, could tell you exactly where north and south were. Then you'd draw an imaginary line up across the sky between north and south, and each time one of 10 particular stars would cross over that line, another hour had passed. That's 10 hours, and then two additional hours, which were the twilight hours before it got dark and before it got light, bam, you've got a 24 hour day. For now, we're gonna put a pin in 12 and 24 and head over to Greece. Fast forward to ancient Greece and there lived an astronomer named Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes, nailed it. Who used the ancient Babylonian sexagesimal system, things divided into 60 from the top of the episode, to wrap the globe with 60 equal latitudinal parts with horizontal lines running through well-known places on earth at the time. The Greeks had already somehow worked out the circumference of the earth pretty accurately by then. A hundred years after that, a younger guy named Hipparchus had up the resolution of this geography to 360 latitudinal lines, and instead of using landmarks, made 360 longitudinal lines also running north to south. Now we had a grid. Next up was Claudius, another hundred years later. He further refined this system by dividing each of the 360 latitude and longitude lines into 60 equal parts, and each of those parts into 60 parts again, calling these parts partes minute prime, the first minute, which later simply became minute, and the smaller segmentations became partes minutes secunde, sure I'm saying that wrong, which means second minute. You can probably see where this is going, the second. The terms minutes and seconds started as geographical mapping lingo. And to add to any confusion that may have already built up so far in listening to this, those minutes and seconds, even though related to the number 60, do not correlate in any way to the minutes and seconds of time. Somehow, between then and now, all these cultures managed to start trading with each other, they figured out how to communicate, they did some war, assimilated some of, but not all of the knowledge of the various civilizations, and we are now left with this fun mix of what's called base 60 for all things circular, geometry tree, navigation, and for some reason time, and then base 10 for our mathematics, the metric system. Except for America, and some odd holdouts of England, Australia, and Ireland, where you folks measure your weight in stones, and then some cockamamie mixture of distances like a foot, which was apparently the size of some king's foot, a mile, which was 1,000 paces of a Roman soldier, and my personal favorite, the furlong, which apparently is the distance an ox can plow before it needs a rest, or 200 meters. Very accurate, consistent figures. I've gotten off topic. This was about time. How is it that we still, a thousand years later, can't agree on a system for how much we weigh or how much pressure is in a car tire? But it seems as if we're all using the same 60 minutes to an hour and 24 hours to a day. Felt like I might be skipping to modern times with this transition, but no, we still got some work to do in the land before time. Julius Caesar, way back in what we now call 45 BCE, believe it or not, they did not refer to the years in such a way at the time, Caesar created the first modern, almost accurate Julian calendar system. He and his astronomer Sausagenes? Sausagenes? 
I don't know. Developed a 365 and one quarter day calendar that unfortunately overestimated the length of a year by just 11 minutes and 14 seconds. This calendar stayed in widespread use for centuries and because of the miscalculation in the length of the year, by the mid 1500s, the shift of the seasons had become off by about 10 days. All those little 11 secondsies had piled up. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII decided to fix it by working out what is now known as the Gregorian calendar. This time they got it right, accounting for leap years every four years, except for years divisible by 100 other than 400. An actual year, one trip around the sun, takes 365 days, 5 hours, 49 minutes, and 12 seconds. This is the calendar we still use now. We are Gregorian in this way. The United States and Britain were both holdouts of this new calendar system all the way until 1752, and by then the two calendars had drifted apart by 11 days. Finally though, the US and the UK went to bed on Wednesday, September 2nd, 1752, and woke up on Thursday, September the 14th. People were mad. In fact, they rioted. I'll leave a link to a story in the description. Apparently, they wanted their 11 days back. Anecdotally, it's said that everyone shifted their birthday by those 11 days, including George Washington, who was 20 years old at the time. Born on February 11th, 1732, but celebrated his birthday on February 22nd from then on. And in fact, a quick Google search on George Washington's birthday tells you that little story. It took another 200 years for the rest of the modern world to make the switch. The Eastern Asian countries made the change in the late 1800s, and bringing it full circle, Greece caved in 1923 join the Gregorian calendar. It was the Roman church that ultimately brought us all into the same year internationally, even if it was through conquering and murdering and, and in a lot of cases erasing the history of smaller civilizations around the world. Days and years had now been established pretty early on, but hours of the day took a lot longer. Mechanical clocks weren't readily available until the 1500s. There just wasn't a lot of innovation between 500 and 1500, that whole Dark Ages thing. People used different methods to keep track of the day, from hourglasses to water clocks to sundials. And even when mechanical clocks were first available, they were super fragile, large, complex machines that really only wealthy families were able to enjoy. And even then, they weren't all that accurate until a series of discoveries over the next 300 years or so would take place. Clocks didn't have seconds, and in many cases didn't even keep track of minutes until the mid-1600s, when Christian Huygens invented a very precise mechanical clock. He used inspiration from Galileo Galilei's work on pendulums. Now there's a name I recognized before this research. Turns out, a pendulum that is exactly 0.994 meters long, that's a bit longer than this, as long as you can keep it swinging at 5 degrees or less, is also swinging further than 5 degrees, will swing back and forth and be at the bottom of each swing once per second. Evidently, it doesn't matter how heavy the thing is, only how long long the thing is. And it doesn't even matter if it's swinging at 5, 4, 3, or 2 degrees. Somehow that also doesn't matter. But a 0.994 pendulum at 5 degrees or less will swing back and forth once every second, every time. So this Hugens fella worked out a series of mechanical elements and a weight that would give a pendulum the tiniest little nudge to keep it swinging and swinging less than 5 degrees for as long as the weight could be pulling down on it. If you ever look at an old grandfather clock, they'll have a couple of weights in the middle hanging down on some chains. And you pull down on the opposite chain to pull up the other weight, which resets the clock, basically keeping it running forever. That little swinging circle thing on a rod in the middle on old clocks is literally what's keeping the time. That was tangential. Where are we? Mid 17th century. That's the point where all the necessary pieces now now exist to get the world operating on the same time. So naturally, we waited a couple hundred more years to bring it all together. Communication was the next major hurdle, and industrialization was its catalyst. As more and more people moved into cities, it became important, at least locally to that city, to have everyone's clocks set to the same time as one another so they could conduct business make meetings, stuff like that. So in each individual city, they would have a jeweler who would set their central clock to where it was noon when the sun was directly overhead. But since we live on a sphere-like object flying through space, noon in Chicago would be a different time than noon in Minneapolis under this system. And for a long time, that was totally fine. People traveled by horse and they didn't travel very far very often. But we were becoming an industrialized society. And as such, we started to enjoy things like trains to move quickly between cities. Pocket watches already existed by this time, but since clocks were set locally, any Anytime anyone would travel and they'd arrive in a new city, their watch would be totally off. There was even this elaborate chart made by the railroad industry to illustrate the growing problem at the time. Cities off by like a few minutes each. And it was the railroads who pushed for the eventual time zone system that we use today. Although at first they had proposed and started to use this system where they chopped up the country to between 50 and 100 different little time zones, which still proved to be an amazing headache to keep track of at the time. So in 1884, US President Chester Allen Arthur, and this is when I learned there was a US president named Chester Allen Arthur, set up the International Meridian Conference in Washington. 25 different countries sent delegations and attended. At this conference, we all agreed that Greenwich, England, 
England would be zero longitude, and America would split up into five time zones 15 degrees apart, starting 60 degrees west of the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. We did it! It was about time. This whole episode's been about time. Almost the whole world was in it together, except Detroit. Evidently, Detroit refused to take part for 16 years until 1900, then sort of changed their mind to be part of the Eastern time zone, then changed their mind back, and then in 1905 finally gave in to the new system. Then some more things happened with time. We found out you can apply an electric charge to quartz crystals and they would oscillate at a more precise, predictable interval. Then came an atomic clock, which in 1999 was accurate to within one second in 20 million years. Interestingly, in order to keep atomic time in agreement with astronomical time, leap seconds must occasionally be added. About eight different minutes every decade contains 61 seconds instead of 60 seconds in order to keep the simulation that we're all living in from breaking. Vous êtes à